Hello and welcome to today's conversation. Uh, global health, how we can make a difference. I'm Dr. Don Hopkins, Vice President for Health Programs at the Carter Center. Today's discussion with former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and New York Times op-ed columnist Mr. Nicholas Kristof kicks off a new series called Conversations on Google, which will be launched formally later this fall. Our discussion began in the American Public Health Association online public health community on Google+, where people posted using the hashtag Carter Convoy, Convo. Also joining us are two of that community's most thoughtful online contributors, who I shall introduce and advise, invite to ask questions a little later. I must remind everyone that we only have 25 minutes and therefore need to keep questions and answers short. Welcome, President Carter and Mr. Christoph. To start off, why is global health important to Americans? Why should Americans care about global health? President Carter? Well, anyone who cares about basic human rights knows that uh, one of the fundamental human rights is a right to good health, as well as a right to, to life, to freedom, uh, to a place to live, a place, food to eat. And global health is something that has been proven in the past, as you yourself, Dr. Hopkins, did to er eradicate the smallpox now 30-something years ago, how important it is not only to the world around uh, in, in uh, developed countries, developing countries, but also to rich nations like ours. So global health touches the life not only of people who are afflicted with uh, unnecessary diseases, but also it touches the life of people who are still healthy and want to prevent those diseases from coming to us and also do benevolent, benevolent things for those in need. Uh, the return on investment spent on improving global health is enormous. The, uh, the profit compared to expenditures ratio is extremely high for global health. So anytime the rich country can help bring better global health uh, to poor countries, the dividends are enormous. So those are just a few uh, reasons why global health is so important. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Christoph? Sure. I, I guess I would say that I think we have national interests at stake uh, that, I mean, for example, when you, Dr. Hopkins, helped eradicate uh, smallpox, there was a real benefit to Americans. We're not being vaccinated against smallpox right now because of, of your work, and uh, there was a real return there. But even b beyond the national interest argument, I guess I would say that we have real values at stake, our national values, that here we have areas where, with a modest investment, we can completely transform the lives of people around the world so that they do not, for example, become uh, blind in middle age from uh, river blindness, from trachoma, so that they can continue to work, uh, look after their children, send their children to school so that their countries can grow and, and blossom and be transformed. So I think we have interests at stake, but most important values. I think I would also add uh, individual uh, benefits, and my favorite example of that would be indirect benefits. Uh, where would the world be, where would South Africa be, for example, if Nelson Mandela had died of measles when he was a child? And it's not that everybody has that kind of potential, but we're all different. And as we lose people uh, and, and people are unable to reach their potential, either through death or being uh, incapacitated somehow, the world is poorer for that. And uh, I think that is another, uh, another reason to me for uh, investing in, uh, in global health. We'll uh, turn now to uh, Mr. Christoph for a question or any... Sure. Let me uh, toss a question out, um, maybe specifically President Carter. Um, you know, I'm sure this is one I hear a lot. I'm sure this is one you hear a lot. That I think there's, frankly, a certain amount of compassion fatigue in the U.S. People are weary with, uh, with the rest of the world, if you will. And so often I hear that, look, we have problems right here at home. Why shouldn't we solve our own problems first before we worry about neglected tropical diseases in, in Mali or in Ethiopia. How do you respond to that kind of concern? Well, I don't think there's any doubt, having been president myself, that we have to take care of our problems back home. And I would say that the investment of the Gates Foundation, the Carter Center, and many others that I need, don't have time to mention, are very wise in trying to bring benefits to others as well. 
the uh, broad effect of, of freedom, of uh, self-respect, of hope that the future will be better, of some element of success in life. Uh, those kind of things are very important, not only to preserve a, a better life for people who have suffered, but also to, to consolidate a more harmonious relationship among human beings no matter where, where we live. And if you go into a poverty-stricken community, uh, where half the people can't go to the field to work, they can't go to school to learn anything, a lot of the others are going blind and so forth. Those kind of things afflict not only the people there, but afflict their entire society within their own countries and what happens in foreign countries, as we know, has a direct potential adverse effect on what we do uh, in the United States. There's also an, the element of just forming, a, a, I'd say, a binding relationship between people who are different. Uh, we just because we are blessed in the United States by a lot of wealth and and and, and fairly good uh, health uh, process in America can be improved doesn't mean that we should ignore people who don't have any of these things and I think the the, the one word that affects my mind most of all is the word neglected neglected tropical diseases is what is the official uh, moniker placed on these kind of diseases by the World Health Organization and that means that they are neglected because they've been eliminated uh, in the moderately rich even countries, and certainly in the rich countries, but they still adversely affect hundreds of millions of people in the poorer countries, particularly in Africa. And that's, that's where the great investment returns are made, because uh, in a community that they can't uh, work in the bottom lands because they have uh, rubber blindness there, and they go up to the hills and abandon the rich soil, or they can't go to the field and work or go to school because of rubber blindness, those things adversely affect all of us. I would add that I, I think that uh, as, as well, the, the cost of helping people in other countries is a fraction of what we spend. If you just look at the, the health area, the, the cost generally is less and it can have tremendous impact. I'm of course uh, most mindful of uh, the example of the Guinea worm eradication program where in 1986 we had an estimated three and a half million cases this year in 2013, we're going to be down to, we expect to have less than 150 cases by the time this year is over. And so there, there are examples like that. Smallpox was an earlier example where uh, investment abroad benefits us indirectly here in the U.S. And so it's not really either or. We need to do both and recognize that uh, we can Can do I just both. follow up on that? Um, I'm uh, of course. Uh, trying to think of a non-morbid, very respectful way of <laughs> expressing this, but <laughs> President Carter, you, you had, uh, I remember you telling me a few years ago that it was kind of a race between you and the guinea worm to see, you know, who would outlast the other. And um, <laughs> the... Uh, are are you winning? Are you confident that you're gonna that 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 you'll be here to see the eradication of guinea worm? Well, I can answer that, uh, Nick. But one thing, I'm in better health than guinea worm. I remember <laughs> going going to uh, going through to some remote areas uh, in Nigeria once, and some children were holding up a sign on the side of the road and said, "Watch out, guinea worm! Here comes Jimmy Carter!" And so I was very proud of that sign. And uh, also, I believe that uh, we'll see, as Don has said, soon the total eradication of guinea worm from the face of the earth, uh, from 300, three and a half million cases down to now about 120 cases. We hope we won't have more than 150 at the end of this year. So when we eliminate this disease, uh, I, I feel fairly confident this time that I'll be willing and able and proud and delighted to see it. Thank you. I want to go now and uh, call on Ms. Emily Brennan, who's at the Rollins School of Public Health in Atlanta. Emily, your question, please. Hi, thank you very much for having me. My question is, how do you hope that we will do things differently in public health in the next generation? And as students, aside from our technical skills that we're learning in class, how should we be preparing to deal with these problems that are so complex? I'll start briefly and just note that um, we have better tools coming online uh, each day. We have um, also more money being spent on international health than certainly was the case when I was starting out in this area. We also have some changing attitudes in this as well. I would, however, caution that 
don't expect to be able to anticipate everything that uh, is going to happen in your professional uh, in your professional life. But I think there are that there there are those kinds of things that will make uh, the opportunity more opportunities to have even greater impact as uh, we move forward. I'd like to add one thing. I think the uh, social media, so-called the iPhones and so forth, that are present all over the world. Uh, has made it possible for individual isolated communities to share their experiences with other communities where formerly, say 15 or 20 years ago, they were not even aware that each other existed. And now, for instance, in Nigeria, we started out with three and a half, with, with uh, 560,000 cases of, of guinea worm. And as one community let the others know, we did away with this long standing disease by doing these things. It greatly magnified the effectiveness of the volunteers and others that we trained from the Carter Center to go in and tell the people what was going on. And, and this is a case with a lot of other diseases. We now have targeted, for instance, rubber blindness or onchocerciasis to be eliminated in countries instead of just control from one year to another. This is a disease uh, that uh, causes a blindness among people because microfilarial miniature worms inside the body ultimately attack the eye. And so we used to just control the disease from one year to another, and the Carter Center has learned in six countries in Latin America that if you use two or more doses per year, we can actually get rid of a disease completely inside a community or inside a nation. So that's the kind of progress that we've made, primarily because uh, people in the modern day can communicate with each other. And I think another thing that's helped uh, to increase the amount of money being spent on these diseases, as Don Hopkins has just pointed out, is the fact that the success stories that have been told by local communities, we did away with this disease that have afflicted our people for thousands of years, that success story gets back to the rich countries and say, well, success is possible. Foreign assistance is possible. It's really, we can really see that it's uh, feasible to do away with these diseases and help not only those people, but help ourselves. Emily, if you know, it, uh, I, I guess my bit of advice would go to something that uh, President Carter just said, the reference to success stories. It seems to me that one of the mistakes that the humanitarian community has sometimes made is to emphasize the problems so much, the glass half full, all the work that is yet to be done, that we, and we journalists have made the same mistake, that we don't adequately focus on the progress. And we thereby leave people sometimes with the impression that we're fighting a losing battle, um, that the world of global health is a depressing one. And in fact, the progress has just been stunning. Uh, you know, if you, you know, we, we, the number of kids dying uh, each year before the age of five has dropped almost in half since 1990. And so I guess my advice would be that, um, you know, to always emphasize that perspective. Sure, there's a lot of work to be done. There has been an awful lot of progress. I would, I would heartily endorse that. And, and I would also add, Emily, uh, be mindful that it's important to understand that your job is to help people to understand how they can help themselves. The, the attitude that we go to communities to tell them what to do or, or, or somehow coerce them what to do is, is the wrong attitude. You want to uh, remember the idea that it's in their capacity to help them themselves with a little bit of outside help. And so the, the challenge is how to mo motivate people to, uh, to make their, their, their own lives uh, better and, and, and not take the attitude that we're here because we have the degrees to tell you what you need to do. Uh, there's a lot of potential there in the, in the communities that uh, can and should be tapped. And if you don't approach it that way, people will resent it and you won't be able to, uh, to see the kind of impact that one would, would want to have. Emily, one more thing very quickly is the importance of publicity. And that's where students and others can help. Uh, for instance, Nick Kristof has been with us in Ethiopia doing away with robo blindness. And he's also been down to South Sudan uh, to work on the Guinea worm program, and also the vote that South Sudanese took to get their own freedom and independence. So I think just just the, the, the relationship between a news media person that's well respected, and, and the readers that spread the word, is very important in getting rid of these uh, horrible blights on people. Great. Thank then, you. Uh, we're gonna.
go now. Thank you very much, Emily. We're going to go now to uh, Ms. Kia Kiakale Monteverde, who's a uh, traditional birth attendant in San Diego. Welcome. Good afternoon. Question, please. Thank you for having me. As a doula and an activist, I'm interested in how women in developing nations can be more supported in their involvement in creating accessible and available health care at their local levels. What suggestions does President Carter have for improving women's rights in these areas? Um, one of the most important uh, and unaddressed problems in the world is the continuing abuse and the derogation and deprivation of women of their justifiable rights. And one of those rights that has been demonstrated very vividly in our health program has been the enormous beneficial role that women have played because they're the first ones that suffer and they're the first ones that can wreck the problem in their own community. Uh, we've been in areas, for instance, in, in Nigeria on a beautiful river where children were swimming in the river for recreation. The, the uh, fathers were maybe fishing, the women were washing clothes, and all of them were, were getting uh, infected with uh, schistosomiasis from little tiny worms that go in through the skin from snails and, and create a very serious problems. And I've seen these children standing up, uh, holding up signs uh, with great big extended pot bellies because they were suffering from schistosomiasis and, and kind of about two-thirds of the size that they ought to be, saying, when I grow up without schistosomiasis, I'm going to be a school teacher or I'm going to be a doctor. I remember what I'm saying, when I grow up without schistosomiasis, I'm going to be a president of, of my country. So it gives people new hope when, when the community gets together and the primary focus of any community has to be the women, the mothers, uh, that shape the entire outcome of health programs within their own community. Can I just add something there? Um, I was going to say that one reason why women disproportionately suffer in uh, so many ways health-wise around the world has to do with the fact, as you know, that they're, that they're marginalized. And so the solutions don't just involve health interventions, but also all kinds of other interventions. If you educate a girl, she will end up having better health care because she's more able to uh, be aware of problems. She's more able to go to a clinic on her own. She's um, uh, more likely to earn an income that will allow her to, to, to look after herself. If you give land title to women, that likewise, uh, it's a roundabout way, but it's, it, it's uh, going to lead to her having better health and looking after her daughters more. So there, there's no silver bullet here, but there is, in a sense, silver buckshot. And any time you go and empower women in myriad ways, you have an impact on their health outcomes. Thank you very much. Any other comments? I'd like to add one other thing. Speaking of women's rights, I would advise everybody to read Half the Sky. It's one of the most remarkable books I've ever written by Nick Kristoff that covers this basic issue of a deprivation of women and girls of their rights. Thank you very much. Terrific. We'll now go to uh, closing remarks and any final uh, thoughts. Uh, President Carter? Well, I'd like to reemphasize one thing, and that is the enormous economic advantages uh, for people when they do away with disease. Well, we ran a, just a small test, a really, really the World Bank did, in a community uh, in, uh, in Nigeria a number of years ago about the impact of guinea worm. And they found that in this really s small community, the, the economic benefits that came to those people who did the work themselves amounted to about $20 million, which is almost half their gross national gross product of that community. Uh, another thing that's happened was that just with river blindness, is, river blindness is caused by the sting of a little black fly that only grows in very rapidly flowing streams. And so the people over thousands of years have found that if they move away from the stream up on the hillsides, they won't have as many people going blind, but they move it away from the rich bottomlands up until the rocky hillsides and therefore reduced their income and their the, uh, beneficial way of life. Now, when we give them a medicine that prevents river blindness, they move back to the bottomlands and they have a much better way to support themselves. So improving people's satisfaction with the way they live reduces the chance of civil wars and internecine violence that results in military action quite often unnecessarily. The, the more we honor and respect and preserve human rights, 
the more people will, will live in peace. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Christoph, final thoughts. Maybe just a couple of suggestions for the, those of us who care about uh, global health to, to, to ruminate on. I think that we can all maybe do a better job of connecting these issues to, um, to, to people around the world uh, who can be made a greater constituency for these issues. Um, and I think part of that involves not just talking about the big numbers, but talking about the individual stories. I think in general, it's those individual stories that get people to care. Um, and then once you build that connection, then it's, one can get people more engaged in these global issues. And the other area where I think we sometimes fall short is, as I alluded to earlier, that we focus so much on the problems that we leave people with a misimpression that Africa in particular is this disaster area where nothing works, where we might as just might as well just surrender. And in fact, that is just so opposite of what has in fact happened in the global health arena. Uh, you know, I think back to the, the first time I visited uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as a, as a student backpacking through, and what really struck me then was the, the blindness and result of river blindness, trachoma, um, other ailments. And nowadays you go through these capitals and you see so many fewer of these people who have been driven to begging. Uh, partly because of the work of President Carter, I visited more recently vast areas of the Sahel countries that have been returned to production because river blindness is no, no longer an area there. Uh, so farmers can go and We're live there and farm. We're going to have to stop it there. Thank you very much. Thank you again, President Carter and Mr. Christoph, for joining us today, as well as Ms. Brennan and Ms. Monteverde. Special thanks also to the New York Times, the Google Plus team, those joining us online, and all the partners that make improving global health possible. I'd like to encourage our audience to continue the conversation in the public health community and by following the Carter Center on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus. Thank you.